In this video, I'll be exploring with you what I call traditional still life photography. I've chosen to focus on this kind of still life work for three reasons. First, it's part of a centuries old tradition that is of fundamental importance to all aspects of still life work. Second, staying focused on traditional still life photography will give us time to look at it in some detail. And third, it's the kind of still life photography I've done the most and know the best. In this video, I'll begin by defining what I mean by traditional still life photography. Then I'll present some important principles of composition that are helpful in the making of a traditional still life image. And finally, I'll end by sharing with you my own workflow for doing this kind of photography. So what is traditional still life photography? Based on reading I've done and studying what others have to say about the subject, I've put together the following definition for traditional still life photography that attempts to distinguish it from other types of photography. <coughs> traditional still life photography is the art of photographing one or more groups of distinct inanimate still objects, intentionally chosen and carefully arranged by the photographer for the purpose of artistic expression. Let me show you three different examples of images that represent the kind of work this definition aims to describe. This photograph is a simple arrangement of everyday objects that one might encounter and enjoy on their coffee break. Sometimes in a still life, there'll be subtle elements in the image that remind us of worldly imperfections, like the flower with a broken stem in this image. This arrangement of three iron objects is a bit more abstract. That is not so much a realistic everyday scene, but more a slightly surreal photographic study of particular aesthetic elements. And this photograph of carefully chosen objects makes an artistic statement through the use of symbols. The skull on the books in this photograph symbolizes the ultimate futility of human thought and knowledge. The disassembled recorder symbolizes the ending of worldly pleasures and diversions. And the wilting flowers symbolize the hard truth of inevitable aging and decay. This photograph is in the Vanita style, an important subcategory of the still life genre, with a long history dating back to the 17th century. Before taking a closer look at our definition of traditional still life photography, let me read it to you one more time. Traditional still life photography is the art of photographing one or more groups of distinct inanimate still objects intentionally chosen and carefully arranged by the photographer for the purpose of artistic expression. The following implications and assumptions are derived from the details of our definition. One, a group of objects means at least three objects. Two, carefully arranged means that the maker of the image has intentionally placed the objects and that the objects are not arranged by accident or by nature or by someone else. Three, distinct objects means the objects are not all the same. And four, still means that there is no actual or implied motion. Let's take a look at a few photographs that I would not consider traditional still lifes and see if we can determine exactly why they don't qualify. There are four questions we can ask about each of these images that are based on the implications and assumptions derived from our definition. A negative answer to any one of the questions means the image is not a traditional still life. It doesn't mean that it's not a good photograph or even a good still life photograph. It just means that it's not a traditional 
still life photograph as we've defined it. The questions are, one, is there a group of at least three objects? Two, are the objects inanimate and motionless? Three, are the objects distinct, that is, not the same? And four, are the objects intentionally arranged by the photographer? In this instance, there's really just one object, a lamp, not a group of objects in this photograph. This photograph fails the first question and is not a traditional still life. When we pose our questions in regard to this photograph, we see that this is clearly a photograph of water in motion. It fails the second question and so it's not a traditional still life. The kiwi slices are not distinct in this photograph, that is, they are not essentially different from each other. So the photograph fails the third question and is therefore not a traditional still life. The objects in this photo were not arranged by the photographer. They were a display at a Civil War reenactment. This photograph fails the fourth question, so it's not a traditional still life. Now let's consider a photograph that I do consider to be a traditional still life and ask our questions. Is there a group of at least three objects? Are the objects inanimate and motionless? Are the objects distinct? Are the objects intentionally arranged by the photographer? In this instance, all the questions can be answered affirmatively. Therefore, the photograph qualifies as a traditional still life. Traditional still life photography has its roots in the great still life paintings of the 17th century, such as this painting by Willem Klaas Haida. One can see this painting and the paintings to follow clearly fulfill our definition of a traditional still life image. There is a group of at least three objects. The objects are inanimate and motionless. The objects are distinct and the objects are intentionally arranged by the artist. This beautiful 17th century still life painting of food items is by Clara Peters. Notice the wonderful detail in all these paintings, and notice how she has used the surface of the table, the small silver plate, the large silver plate, the salt cellar, and the blue plate on top of the stack of cheeses to create five different levels in the arrangement. Also notice how the knife functions as a leading line, bringing the eye into the painting. This still life painting is by the great 17th century still life artist Peter Klass. There are a lot of objects of different sizes, textures, and colors in this still life. And there's realistic detail throughout the painting. Notice how the arrangement of the objects in this painting, as well as the lighting, creates a diagonal separation of the negative space from the positive space. Here's another Peter Klaas still life painting in the Vanitas style, which is fraught with symbolism. The skull and bone, the extinguished lamp, and the overturned dressing, drinking vessel all represent different aspects of death. The pocket watch represents the fleetingness of time, and the quill, papers, and book represent the limitations and futility of intellectual pursuits. The key in the lower left corner of this painting is said to symbolize the lustful corruption of purity, which is represented by the blue ribbon attached to the key. Notice how the negative space is approximately equal to the positive space in this painting. So now that we know what kind of image we're trying to create with traditional still life photography, we can begin to consider how to assemble and arrange objects in such a way that they will create a well-composed image. Arrangement and composition is really the essence of traditional still life photography. When composing a traditional still life, 
use a variety of object heights, sizes, textures, and colors. This photograph has objects that vary in size and height from the small nuts to the large vase. There are textures that range from the smooth hardness of porcelain, glass, and metal, and the rougher hardness of the nuts, to the softer textures of the fruit, the loaf of bread, and the folds of the tablecloth. There are also a variety of colors in this image from a warm tonal palette of red, yellow, orange, and brown. This photograph also has different sized objects of different heights, ranging from the tall carafe of milk to the flat Oreo cookie. There is also the texture of glass contrasted with the texture of the fabric and the cookies, especially the broken cookie. Texture is critical to traditional still life photography, and if you look closely you see that even the paint on the wall behind the arrangement has detailed texture in it. And this 17th century example has objects ranging from the tall champagne glass and metal cup to the tiny pomegranate seeds on the silver platter and table. It has textures ranging from hard, smooth glass and metal to crusty bread and slimy oysters and juicy fruit. There are also a variety of colors, especially reds, yellows, and greens. Try to create different levels in your still life photograph if you can. Creating different levels can be a challenge, but it makes a real difference to the look of the image. Here I've used cake stands in a small bowl on a pedestal to create the different levels. In a different kind of still life, such things as piles of books or objects piled on top of each other can be used to create levels. For instance, in this photograph, the stacked plates create a level that elevates the larger scones and separates them from the other pastries in the photograph. And in this 17th century example, the lemons in the elevated dish and floating greenery are on one level, and the different sized objects simply laying on the table itself are on another level. Intentionally overlap and separate objects and groups of objects in your still life arrangement. Here you can see that the four books form a group of overlapping objects that is separate from the other objects in the arrangement. In this photograph, the two pears are separated from the other objects in the arrangement, and the apple overlaps the base of the bowl of grapes. In this 17th century example, the individual nut and the nutshell are separated from the other objects in the image. The bowl of nuts overlaps the stoneware jug and wine glass, while the piece of fruit neither overlaps nor is separated from the bowl of nuts, but just barely touches it, which is the third option that can be considered. Give careful thought to establishing a distinct foreground and background in your still life arrangement. This is very important to creating that classic 17th century traditional still life look. I often use tablecloths of different sorts for my foregrounds, especially if they have a little texture to them, as well as bare tabletops. A plain painted wall can work as a background as we've seen, though it's not always a particularly interesting background. In this photograph, the background is vinyl floor tiles glued to a piece of plywood. More recently, I've been using wallpaper glued to foam board, and occasionally I paste in backgrounds using Photoshop. This photograph has a background of vintage wallpaper glued to a piece of foam board. The foreground is a panel of wood painted blue to simulate a tabletop. This 17th century example has an unusually light background with architectural detail and a foreground of a green tablecloth and a very large white napkin 
with lots of light and shadow detail in the folds of the fabric. It's good to have this kind of detail in the foregrounds and backgrounds of this artistic style. Place objects at several different depths into the scene when you're arranging your still life. It's important to give your traditional still life photograph a three-dimensional feel. Placing objects at different depths into the scene will help do this. Here the objects are placed in the arrangement from the very front of the scene to the back. And the lemon peel and part of the silver plate are even forward of the tablecloth foreground similar to many 17th century paintings, thereby creating an even stronger three-dimensional feel to the photograph and also a sense of instability that metaphorically represents the precariousness of all worldly things. In this 17th century example, the objects range from the salt cellar at the back of the table to the knife and silver platter that are partly off the front edge of the table, as in the previous image, and there are several objects in between these two extremes. Use negative space, diagonals, leading lines, proximity, and color to guide the eye through your image. In this photograph, there's quite a bit of negative space. Leaving a substantial amount of negative space in still lifes was common in the 17th century and seems to work well for traditional still lifes in general. The shadowy quality of the negative space in this photograph helps bring the eye to the light of the positive space. In general, the photograph is bisected diagonally, which makes the composition a bit more dynamic and once again was common in the 17th century and works well with many still life photographs. The apple and orange are in close proximity, making this an area of stronger interest in the image. Similarly, the bright colors of these two objects attracts the eye to this part of the photograph. In this image, notice how the leading line of the wooden spoon brings the eye into the arrangement. This 17th century example captures the eye initially with a large pewter pitcher. The eye is then attracted to the color of the bowl of glowing embers and to the glass of beer that is in close proximity. As the eye continues its rightward momentum to the matchsticks, it encounters clay pipes and a carefully placed matchstick that form leading lines back through the center of the image to the tobacco wrapped in paper, which seems to be the actual focus of the image. As you can see, there's a great deal that can be learned about arrangement and composition from carefully studying these masterful 17th century still life paintings. It's important to use fairly strong directional light in your traditional still life photograph and to include shadow elements. The look we typically want is bright, direct or indirect sunlight streaming in through a window or doorway onto your arrangement. You don't need elaborate lighting to do traditional still life photography. In this photograph and in most of the photographs you are seeing, I use a single LED light source. In 17th century still life paintings, you often see a diagonal line separating dark negative space from light or positive space. A similar effect is seen in this photograph. In this case, the effect was created by flagging or blocking some of the light from falling on the background of the arrangement with a large piece of cardboard. This effect can also, under the right circumstances, be created in Photoshop or Lightroom during post-processing using the gradient tool. For the sake of convenience and control, I generally use artificial continuous lighting for still lifes. However, it's entirely possible to do traditional still life photography with only natural light. This image was made with no artificial lighting, 
only direct sunlight streaming through a northwest window in the late afternoon. This 17th century example has strong natural light coming from a high window out of view on the left. We can see it streaming in and casting a streak of light on the wall in the background and creating many highlights and shadows amongst the objects on the table, especially within the folds of the blue fabric. Finally, arrange the objects in your image with balanced asymmetry as an objective. Asymmetrical balance is critical for a well-composed traditional still life. Although this image is totally asymmetrical as it should be, there is a sense of balance from left to right. The visual weight of the right side of the image is approximately the same as the visual weight on the left side of the image. This is because that even though the objects on the right side are smaller, there are three objects rather than two, and two of the three objects are towards the front of the image. Also, the bowl of nuts is close to the edge of the image, thereby increasing its visual weight. Ideally, in an asymmetrically balanced image, there should be three destinations for the eye to visit as it travels the image. The first destination is known as the dominant form. In this case, it's the Buddha statue because it's large and is forward of the dried flower arrangement. The second destination is known as the subdominant form, and in this case, it's the bowl of nuts, again because it's forward of the wooden case and because of the lighting. The final destination is the subordinate form, in this case the incense bowl and the burning incense, which is the focal point of the image. In a well-composed, asymmetrically balanced image, the eye is led from the obvious to the more subtle. It's desirable to have the eye cover a significant amount of the image's real estate in this three-point journey. So it's good to have the dominant form well to one side and to have the subdominant form near a point of balance on the other side, and then to have the subordinate form somewhere between the two. This second example of balanced asymmetry is easy to analyze as there's only three groups of objects. The large bag of dog food is clearly the dominant form. The three cans on the other side of the image are the subdominant form and the dish between the two is the subordinate form. The image is more or less balanced as there are more objects on the right even though they are smaller. Also, the heavy weight of the bag of dog food is somewhat centralized because it leans into the overall arrangement. And the dish of dog food in front of it pulls the weight of the left hand side of the image toward the center of the image. In this 17th century example of balanced asymmetry, the large roamer containing wine on the left is clearly the dominant form due to its size. The roll on the right is the subdominant form because of its color, the lighting, and its placement on the far right. And the lemon is the subordinate form due to its placement between the dominant and subdominant forms, the lighting once again, and its forward placement in the image. Now that we know some of the principles for arranging and composing our image, we can begin to talk about the actual process or workflow of making a traditional still life photograph. Before we begin though, this is what you will need for equipment for making your photograph. You will need a camera that can be focused with an appropriate lens. My experience has been that a normal or portrait lens works well for this kind of photography. With a crop sensor camera, this would be a 35 millimeter or 50 millimeter lens. And with a full frame camera, it would be a 50 millimeter or 85 millimeter lens. 
In traditional still life photography, you will be taking multiple images that need to be perfectly aligned and merged, so a tripod is critical for this work. If you have a cable release for your camera and can set the mirror in the up position before taking each image, this will also help make the make perfect images with no motion blur. Some kind of directional lighting will need to be available. I personally like to use continuous lighting. Because our arrangement is by definition motionless and we can make long exposures, lighting of modest intensity is not a problem. You will need a background and a foreground. For a background, you can either choose something existing like a wall, or you can create a backdrop using materials and a support. You also need a horizontal space to place your arrangement on. A table is probably the most convenient. Of course, you will need to select objects and props for the image. And finally, you will need post-processing software such as Photoshop or Photoshop and Lightroom. It's essential that the software can do focus stacking. If your post-processing software doesn't do focus stacking, standalone focus stacking software is available, such as Zarene Stacker or Helicon Focus. So now we can begin looking at the overall workflow. The first six steps to creating a traditional still life image are pretty straightforward and are primarily concerned with composing and arranging your image. The last four steps though are more technical and involve post-processing images. I'll be showing you how to work with raw images in these last four steps, but please know that these steps can also be done with JPEG images but of course with less personal control over the final results. So step one of our workflow is to choose a variety of objects with a theme, mood, story, or concept in mind. Remember artistic expression is why we do traditional still life photography in the first place and in fact is an important part of the definition of traditional still life photography. In this case, the objects chosen are around the theme or concept of a good, wholesome breakfast. Step two is to choose a distinctive foreground and background and to put them in place. The foreground and background should have some relationship to the objects in your, in your arrangement and contribute to the overall intent of your image. In this case, I've chosen vintage wallpaper and a checkered tablecloth to reinforce the simple, wholesome country kitchen quality I have in mind for this image. Step three is to arrange the objects in groups with the objects at different depths and heights within the arrangement. Step four is to adjust the groupings for good overall composition. Notice that there are different heights, colors, and textures to the objects in this arrangement and that the objects are arranged with a dominant group, a subdominant group, and a subordinate group. Step five is to arrange the lighting so that it's strong and directional. Here you can see the use of a large cardboard flag to cast a dramatic shadow on the background. Step six is to check and adjust the composition of the image looking through the camera. This is because looking through the lens of your camera will give quite a different perspective of the arrangement. Step seven is to make several separate images of your arrangement, moving the focus point deeper into the arrangement in small increments with each image in preparation for focus stacking. Let's pause for a moment and talk about focus stacking. Focus stacking is a digital image processing technique where where multiple source images with limited depths of field are combined to create a new resultant image 
with an extended depth of field. Each of the source images intentionally has a different part of what is being photographed in focus. The resultant image is simply the different in focus areas of those images stitched together to form an image that is more completely focused overall. The next few slides will help to clarify this process. Let's start with our objective. This 17th century still life painting by Peter Klass is the look we want to end up with. Everything is equally in focus in this painting from front to back and side to side. But as you probably know, this is not so easy to achieve in photography. Because of the nature of lenses, without the intervention of focus stacking, some parts of a photographic image will always be less in focus than others, at least to some degree, depending on the situation, the particular lens, and the settings being used. A quick example, in this photograph shot at an aperture of f5.6, with a 50 millimeter lens on a crop sensor DSLR, only the, only the foreground is in focus. In this refocused new photo of the same arrangement, using the same lens and aperture, only the caraway and coriander bottles and the measuring spoons are in focus. In this photo, only the chili powder and salt are in focus. And in this photo, only the basil and wallpaper are in focus. However, if we focus stack the four photos and make a new image using only the in-focus parts of the four photos, we get this as a result. Everything is in focus, just like it was in the Peter Class painting. So it's in preparation for this that we're taking several separate exposures in step seven and moving the focus point back very slightly in each exposure. Step eight of our workflow is to make some initial post-processing adjustments to all the images in our focus stack. Here's a short video clip showing the post-processing I usually do at this point in my workflow. We're in the library module of Lightroom where I have imported the images in my focus stack into a collection. The first image has a gray card in it and I use that image to set the pre preliminary post-processing settings that I'll be applying to all the images. The reason we do this now rather than after the focus stacking is because the RAW files have a much larger dynamic range than the PSD or TIFF file that comes back from focus stacking. So let's go to the develop module with the gray card image. The first thing I want to do is to set my white balance by taking the eyedropper tool and clicking on the gray card. I have the initial settings in my develop module set up so that everything is pretty much zeroed out, except I start with my highlights closed down all the way and uh, to the left, and my shadows are opened up all the way to the right. I'm going to bring the shadows back to zero because the shadows are important in this particular image. Looking at the histogram, my blacks seem to be okay set at zero, but the whites need to be brought up to maybe, mm, maybe around 45, 44. <clears throat> And I think these adjustments are sufficient for our preliminary post-processing. So I'm going to go up to settings and, and save what we've done. I'm going to copy the settings. Now I'm going to go back to the library module 
and apply them to the other images. I'm going to select the other images in the focus stack. And then I'm going to go up to photo to develop settings. And now I'm going to paste those settings that we did to the gray card image into the uh, other images in my focus stack. Now that that's been done, I simply need to make sure all the images I want in my focus stack are selected. And then I go up to photo and I select edit in. And I'm going to Photoshop, but I want to go down to the bottom and open all these images as layers in Photoshop. This will automatically bring us over to Photoshop where we can do our focus stacking. Step 9 is where we focus stack the images. This video clip will show how that's done. Now we're in Photoshop where all the images in our focus stack have been imported as layers. The first thing we need to do is to select all the layers. And then go up to Edit and select Auto Align Layers. We'll use the default projection of Auto and we'll, uh, we won't do any uh, lens correction. Now we click on OK and Photoshop will go through all these layers and make sure that all the objects in the layers align perfectly with each other. This process takes a while on my computer so I'll fast forward now through the wait time. Now that the layers are all perfectly aligned, we can go back to edit, making sure that all our layers are selected. And this time we select auto blend layers. We want to be sure that stack images is selected. And this time we want to include the two options at the bottom. Once again, this is going to take a while to accomplish, so I'll fast forward through the processing. And now our images have all been focus stacked into the new layer at the top. You can see the layer masks that have been applied to each of these layers to select only the most in focus parts of each layer. The result of our focus stacking, as I said, is in the top layer, so the other layers are no longer needed, and we can simply select them and delete them. And the reason we do this is because it greatly reduces the size of the file that gets passed back to Lightroom. Now all we need to do is select Save, and we'll be back in Lightroom ready to put the finishing touches on the PSD or TIFF file that comes back from Photoshop. Finally, in step 10, we make any refined post-processing adjustments to our final stacked image that might be needed. This video clip will show how I typically complete an image. And now we're back in Lightroom. The Focus Stack PSD file from Photoshop comes back highlighted, so it's easy to find. Now I'm going into the Develop module to make our final adjustments. The first thing I want to do is to crop the image to an 8 by 10 and perhaps level it a bit. The uh, 
um, the milk bottle is clearly our, our dominant form in this image. And uh, it's pretty bright and I think it attracts the eye okay, pretty much as it is. The orange juice is perhaps our uh, subdominant form. <clears throat> and I think I'd like to try brightening it up a little with the brush tool so that it attracts our eye even more over to it. I'm going to um, push the exposure up by a quarter of a stop and, and see what that looks like. I can already see that it's going to make a subtle but important improvement. And our um, granola is, is our subordinate form and the focal point of the image. And I think I'd like to try maybe pushing that up uh, about a quarter of a stop as well. Oh yes, that makes a big difference. So at this point, I think I'd like to uh, maybe open the shadows just a little bit so that we can see maybe in here a little bit more. So I'm gonna push the shadows up. Something like that, just so we can see in here a little bit more. And then the last thing I like to do is to add a little bit of vignetting down here in effects. Um, it darkens the corners and the edges of the image and helps bring the eye back in um, towards the center of the, the image. And actually, I think that's probably enough processing for this particular image. And here it is, our completed traditional still life photograph. It was about two years ago that I decided to try doing this kind of photography, and I found that I very much enjoy it. There's still much for me to learn and many skills that I've yet to acquire. I'm very much a student in discovering new aspects of still life work all the time. Perhaps that's one reason I don't get tired of doing it. There's something fundamentally satisfying to me in gathering ordinary objects together and doing my best to carefully arrange them into beautifully composed images, like an oil paint artist in a studio might. It's really a much different way of working and seeing than simply going out and taking pictures. I've discovered that in traditional still life photography, each image really is an art project unto itself, involving all that planning, arranging, lighting, post-processing, and more we've been talking about in this video. As many of us have come to know through our own experience, a turning point for any developing pho photographer 
is often when we stop taking pictures and start creating photographs by willingly committing to the meticulous effort needed well before and well after pressing the shutter to get a truly artistic result. Traditional still life photography is certainly one way a photographer can make and sustain that distinguishing commitment. Having said that, I'll end this video with a quote by Matt Hardy. Beauty can be seen in all things. Seeing and composing the beauty is what separates the snapshot from the photograph.